300 slides. And, um, I think I've only got 60 of them picked for today. So. I'm going to start off by talking about just ba basic earth shapes. And hopefully, you all have a pretty good idea about this. <coughs> You've probably heard about latitude and longitude since like middle school, maybe. Um, we're familiar with the latitude longitude coordinate system. Um, it's all should be straightforward. There's a different kind of illustration in case you were curious where the, the, the angles that define the line of latitude and the longitude. And in a lot of uh, map projection formulas, you'll see these Greek letters. The phi and lambda stand for latitude and longitude. I'm not going to be going into any formula today, uh, but that's the, those are the standard variables you'll see. So of course, the Earth's not a perfect sphere. And that creates all sorts of problems. <coughs> the, um, it's closest to something called, no, it's not closest for mathematical purposes and map projections, we use the geoid, the ellipsoid, rather. We'll get to the geoid in a minute. Uh, the Earth's pretty well represented by an ellipsoid. What is that? Well, it's a revolution of an ellipse about one axis. So it's a, a, a Earth is about 1 three hundredths away from a perfect sphere, meaning the short axis is 1, is one three hundredths shorter than the long axis, um, the semi-major and semi-minor. So that's called the flattening factor. It's about one part in three minutes. And then here's a, just a little illustration of this. And notice there are two different ellipsoids on here, one called the ellipsoid A and the ellipsoid B. And it depends on what part of the world you're living in <coughs> as to which ellipsoid is going to fit your continent, your country best. There are many different ellipsoids in use around the world. There's just a set of some that uh, you'll encounter. It sounds, seems like you wouldn't encounter something as old as Clark 1866. But in fact, if you've used any USGS topographic maps, paper maps, anybody? <laughs> no? Yeah. Um, anyway, the, the paper maps that you'll find in the bookstore, um, or all the ones in the library, are based on um, datum from 1927, which was based on an ellipsoid first developed by Clark in the 1800s, literally. Um, most of your GPS coordinates and um, so on will come in GRS 80 or w WGS 84. I'm not going to go into them in any detail uh, other than to say WGS 84 is a world geodetic system in 1984. There are actually many different versions of WG WGS 84. Um, and they have a function. They have, they're a function of how many weeks the GPS satellite, as GPS satellite system, has been in function. The more the satellites are up there, the more precise shape we, the information we have about the shape of the Earth, and so it just keeps getting better and better and better. So I was talking about the ellipsoid. So the ellipsoid does a decent job representing the shape of the Earth. But it's not that simple because it's really more like a bumpy potato. <laughs> you get your crayons, brought in some fruit, so I brought in a potato. <laughs> so, and that's because unlike the, you know, most fruit, the potato better illustrates the shape of the geoid. It's not a perfect sphere. It's not a nice ellipsoid. But it, does, it is sort of smooth. The changes in curvature are smooth as we work around, move around it. And that's very much like the ellipse again. You pass that around. <laughs> um, Don't need it. Yeah, too. I need that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so all right. So thinking back to the fact that there were different ellipsoids. Well, the ellipsoids are based on the ellipsoid that fits our part of the world is based on the geoid. The geoid is what we call an equipotential or equipotential surface. Everywhere on that geoid, the pull of gravity is exactly the same. So it's not like we're on a sphere. We, we weigh less when we go up to 14,000 feet and so on. If you, if you found the surface where the pull of gravity was exactly the same everywhere, that would create what's called an equipotential surface. Okay. 
Now, surveyors have been out you know, mapping the country um, for many decades, uh, more than a century, um, using some pretty primitive technologies originally. Um, but even still today, using uh, uh, lots of plane table, those are still in use today. And uh, you'll see you know, GPS systems are still adapting. You can see in this diagram the um, the surveyor is measuring the angles between points. We measure the angles very precisely between points, much more so than we can get distances. Okay? We can measure the angle to summits that we can't get to. Okay? And using those angles, we can put together the triangles, the network of triangles, that lets us get uh, very precise estimates. So this is just illustrating the, the network of triangles you might go through as you're working your way across the country. They actually use these things called Hilby Towers. They would erect this tower for a week or two weeks while they surveyed that area, then take it down, move it 50 miles further down the country. The, all of those points you see in there, in that diagram, were used to create a datum for um, the United States, oh, now North American data in 1927. So once they have surveyed all of these points, they then sort of anchor it to the surface of the Earth. They decide where the where the zero zero point is, if you will. And of course, the, the zero zero latitude longitude is over where the prime meridian across the equator crosses the equator. But we also have to, since we're not measure, making measurements from there, all of our all of our measurements are based on distance from Meads Ranch, Kansas. And it's literally a monument out there on a private ranch that you can't get to today. You've probably all encountered, uh, hopefully you've all encountered something like this, a benchmark. This one doesn't say it. Uh, well, this one says Meads Ranch. Most of them will say it's a felony to remove this marker. And so you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually not a real marker. We're not receiving a gift of appreciation for participating in a survey of the GPS survey of the Pikes Peak in Colorado. Early days of GPS systems, we went up to the top of the mountain, set up a GPS system on a tripod, and sat there for eight hours. And my job was to keep the tripod from blowing over. <laughs> and I got the I got the benchmark out of it. So up there you see the the way they still work today is they'll set up a survey and it's still works off of these benchmarks. So set up a tripod directly over that and make their measurements from there. Now think about how that tripod is set up. There's a thing called a plumb bob. It hangs straight down, and it hangs directly over the center of that benchmark. Well, is that plumb bob pointing to the center of the Earth, to the exact center of the Earth? No. But what's it doing? It's going straight down. You've got where you want to grab your pole. Gravity, exactly. So it's, it's being pulled wherever gravity is strongest. And remember, it's a very irregular surface. The geoid, this is greatly exaggerated, of course, but there are all these fluctuations in the, in the shape of the Earth, the shape of the geoid, and if you're trying to do any sort of precise measurement, you need to consider that because it's, it becomes a significant, the errors would just accumulate as you move around. The so we've got that potato up there, don't forget it. Um, <laughs> our sense of the shape of that geoid keeps getting better and better over time. So that was in the 1970s, this is uh, the 1990s, and it continued to get better. Um, here's a list of those geoids, sorry, the ellipsoids that are based on the geoids indirectly. Um, you've got to be a little careful, someone like Clark actually developed two different one in 1860, one in 1866, uh, 1880, 1866. Anyway, 
Here's another way of looking at that colorful diagram. If we just project that into a map, a two-dimensional map, we can see the low points and the high points uh, illustrated in this black and white image. So I haven't said much about datums, but the datum was the thing that was sort of anchored to Meads Ranch, Kansas. Um, well, in the 1980s, they had much better information. They'd, they'd done thousands and thousands more, more points had been surveyed. And they had a much better estimate of the shape of the Earth, much better estimates of the locations of every point. And so the location of that point was no longer that latitude and longitude. It had a different latitude and longitude. And the shift between those two datums was in Southern California about 80 meters. That's very significant. So if you encounter data and you're off by about 80 meters in Southern California, it's quite likely it's a datum shift problem. Uh, depending on where you are in the country, um, obviously there's a certain zero point running here through the middle states. Which is, and that's just in longitude. There's a similar variation in latitude. Um, in Southern California, it's, it's relatively trivial, the latitude change. And of course, don't forget magnetic north. Um, the um, surveyors, uh, public land surveyors, most of them were pretty good. Most of them thought to correct for magnetic north. But there are some examples in the public land survey system <coughs> where the entire grid is rotated and defined about 13 degrees which was the magnetic declination at that point. Not all the surveyors were, were well trained. All right, so that's pretty much the, the part on the Earth shapes. Now we get into sort of the heart of, of map projections, we're going from once we have that shape, once we figured out and figured out what ellipsoid we're going to use, uh, what datum we're using, then we get into the, the area of map projections. So projections are often categorized by what sort of developable surface they're on. There are three main developable surfaces. A plane, anything that's based on a plane is called an azimuthal projection. A cylinder, anything based on a cylinder is cylinder. And a cone is called a cone. Can you think of any others? solids you can project a map onto. You're basically putting the globe inside that sur surface, inside that object, and then you're projecting out onto that. It's still considered a developable surface because once it's on that, we can slice it open and flatten it out without any further distortion. Now, Many of these projections, some of these projections, um, can be envisioned by um, projecting a globe onto a, onto a surface, whether we're talking about a plane or a cone or a cylinder. Um, and if you think about putting sort of a light source, a point of light, right in the very center of the globe, projecting it out onto a cylinder or a plane or a cone, that's what you're supposed to imagine as the developable surface is, is how you create that. At this point, I um, just want to remind you or tell you that any sort of map projection, every map projection, will involve some sort of distortion. There's absolutely no way to turn a spherical or nearly spherical Earth into a flat map without distorting something. These are more illustrations of the certain cylindricals where the projection cylinder in this case touches the globe. That's considered a standard line. At that point, there's no distortion whatsoever. <coughs> if from that, you spread the parallels, this particular spacing, you get something called a Mercator projection. 
you can spread that out in different ways. This is actually showing the central cylindrical, and then it's been modified to produce the mercator. And you, again, you can, in poly, you can imagine this with a, a light source, a point of light in the center of the globe. Here's one cylindrical equilaria. You can also project them to a cone. Now, let me just see. Um, so we talk about being able to project it onto a plane, that would be an azimuthal. From there we can distort it many different ways, we can project those lines many different ways. So this was a, just an ordinary 12 inch acrylic globe, it had actually cracked and fallen apart <coughs> into two halves. And I was thinking now was the chance if I was ever going to produce something like this. This was my this was my chance. Put together a lamp-like system with a it's not a perfect point source of light, but it, it does a pretty good job. So there we have a nice bright point source of light. Quick tangent: um, the first one of these I produced I put a really bright 300 watt incandescent in. Melt. And this began also. to melt. <laughs> <laughs> to take that up, dialed it back to 100 watt. It still um, warmed up a little um, more too much, too much for uh, my taste. And so kept going to compact fluorescent, which wasn't as bright. And this is an LED, so I can leave that on for many, many minutes before this gets uh, too hot. So let's see what that looks like. Here's a plane. I can just hold this. Oh. Right answer. <laughs> so <laughs> I can project. I'm literally projecting the outline of the content. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. <laughs> so. And notice the way I'm holding this is I, all of, in all of these cases, the plane is touching at the equator. I can do the same thing touching at, the, at either pole. Sorry to show you this. Or it doesn't have to be that. I can move this around. These are called those bleak aspects. So I don't know what the answer to the question about the LA River is, but one pretty darn good projection would be to find the LA River find an azimuthal projection that was centered on, right on the river, you're not going to get much distortion. The blurriness that you see, if it wasn't obvious, the blurriness that you see is where you're getting more and more distortion. There's no distortion right there at the center where it touches. It looks great in focus. Everywhere else you're getting increasing distortion. So that's projected onto a plane. <coughs> Can we do it with a cylinder? Sure. It's not quite as impressive as the first time. I see. So we can project onto that cylinder. Again, it's touching at the equator. That's the standard line. So there's no distortion at that point. And as we get further away from that, it begins to start to see it getting blurry as we're getting more and more distortion. And this is just one set of projections with the light source smack in the center. Imagine a fluorescent tube going right through along the axis projecting out with all the projection lines parallel. You get a very different projection, but you can do that pretty easily. Um, and this doesn't have to be this orientation. We can experiment with this. We can do oblique orientations. We'll see a bit later um, how you might take this all the way 90 degrees and produce a, a transverse for cable. So that's the cylinder. That leaves one surface, which is the cone. This was the hardest one to create. So it's not too bad. So if this cone were, we were projecting under this cone, and this were tangent right there, then it would be perfect at that point, and distorted the further we moved, it, moved away. Um, this cone is, is designed so that I can unsnap it there, 
and I can use different shaped cones. I can use flatter and flatter and flatter cones. And actually, if you took that to a limit, just imagine, uh, you're into the math, if we went to a <coughs> sharper and sharper cone, this would actually ultimately lead us to a cylinder. And if we go the other direction, it would ultimately lead us to a plane. In many of these math projections, it's the limit. The conical version is intermediate to the, the other two. So, but this is going to only show me two, and I wasn't happy with that. So, I now bought myself a dog collar. <laughs> and I was going to take the dog. And so I can create any shape cylinder I want, cylinder cone I want with this. All of these that I've illustrated so far, the, the shape, the developable surface, has just been tangent to the globe, meaning it's just touches. We'll see in a minute um, some of the other options. I think it's on the table. It's on the yeah, table. Yeah. It's under the table, Mark. Under the table. Yeah, yeah. I, fell. I fell. It fell off? I didn't knock it off. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the azimuthal equidistant, that's if, if you project it onto the plane. Um, this is showing the center of the North Pole. So all of the cases I've described have been tangent. It just touched the globe. Imagine a slightly di different one. Imagine taking this plane, and instead of just touching it at one point, we sliced it through the globe. So maybe this parallel was less intersected with this plane. Then I'd have much, I'd have zero distortion along that entire parallel, and distortion would increase towards the middle and uh, towards the edge. But I've improved it. Instead of just having a single point, I now have a circle that um, has zero distortion. Now, to put the plane, we can do the same thing with that cone. Imagine it cutting into the surface of the Earth at that parallel, it would pop out and come out the Earth at a different parallel. And depending on you know, where the shape of the cone we use determines what those two parallels are. Uh, two parallels determine the shape of the cone. So there's an illustration. Uh, aspects. That's the uh, term for how that developable surface is oriented with respect to the, the globe. This would be at the equator, it would be considered equatorial, pole, polar, pretty obvious. Transverse doesn't make any sense with the plane. We'll see how it makes sense with the, the cylinder. Uh, oblique, that's at any odd angle. Keep in mind we don't have to, we don't have to we can, we can turn a, a cone oblique, too. Why would we want to turn a cone in some oblique aspect? Depending on what part of the world you're working with. Depending on what part of the world you're working on. Follow on that? Yeah, you're right. Because you want it to be more or less distorted in that particular area. OK, so if you want, if you want minimum distortion, suppose you're doing a piece of the world like Japan. Japan has this arc to it. It's not sort of straight up and down. It's not east-west. It has this arc to it. And we could find the right cone that cut in right there. So the standard line traced the axis of Japan, you know, approximated the medial axis of Japan. We can move that all around. There's an oblique cone that's used for the panhandle of um, Alaska. There is just sort of summarizing the, um, the projections on the three surfaces, plane, cone, and cylinder, and the different aspects. Now distortions, you've heard me already talking about the standard lines. Um, let's think about what it, what it, what's being distorted. When you're thinking about the distortions that are occurring in the projection, think back to the globe. 
I always think back to the globe and what sort of, of angles and shapes and areas you can see <coughs> in the globe. So this is, I mean, this is a projection right here. So it's hard to, you know, it's been, been projected under this flat screen up here. So this is not obviously the curved surface. But there's, it's still trying to indicate that you know, where the parallels cross the meridians, those should be right angles. There are right angles everywhere on the globe. So if it went distorted, those would all be right angles. The areas between similarly bounded meridians, so this area, then that area, then that area, they get smaller on the globe. So on the ideal map projection or on an equal area map projection, they would also get smaller, you know, et cetera. So what sorts of distortion are we working with? You just heard me talk about areas, maybe you've heard of equal area maps. There's a whole class of equal area map projections. Distances, it would be really nice to have a, a map projection on which you could preserve distances. Imagine having a map projection on the wall in the travel agency's office. You guys might use travel agency <laughs> But imagine you're a travel agent, um, and you'd like to be, or just in your own wall, on, on a map in your own wall in your room, um, you'd like to be able to look at the distance between these two points and compare that to the distance between these two points and these two points. It turns out it's impossible. There's no map projection that will preserve distances everywhere. Then you have the name equidistant in their title, but that's only equal, the distances are only preserved in certain directions, or, or radially to a certain point. Directions. That's something we'd like to preserve. I break directions down into two different kinds. One is what we call the rum lines, and that's what are preserved on the Mercator projection. The proper name for those is the loxodrome, or the fancy name for those is the loxodrome. We'll see some of those. But that's the, the Mercator was well known for the is projection which preserve rum lines as straight lines. The other kind of, of line that would be nice to preserve, or direction that would be nice to preserve, is the great circle route, or the geodesic. So that's what we'd like to be able on the map, is to draw a line, straight line, and that traces out the shortest route. That would be great. Turns out there is one projection, mnemonic, that, pres that preserves that. The problem with it is it can't do much at all up here. It'll do a, a, about the size of a continent, <coughs> and it already starts to get pretty well, pretty distorted. We'll see an example of that. The fourth area of distortion that we talk about is angles. Think back to the surveyors, how important it was for them to preserve angles. Well, the maps that they would produce would ideally pre preserve all those angles perfectly. A map that preserves angles, a map projection that preserves angles, is called conformal. Um, in many sources, you'll hear that called shape. And it's very similar to preserving the shape, but it's not perfect. It's not preserving the shape perfectly. Because that's, that's impossible to do with an irregularly shaped object. Imagine taking a coat hanger and, and shaping it to match the outline of, of Greenland. Well, that shape is, has a third dimension to it. So you can't preserve that shape. It's not possible. You can preserve shapes of very small areas, almost perfectly, but still not perfect. So two of those properties, which are especially nice, would be especially nice if you could preserve them, area and angle, are mutually exclusive. So unfortunately, those are the two that you would most often like to preserve, and you can't. You can preserve one or the other, but not the other. It's another illustration of a great circle route versus a geodesic route. So on this particular map, we have shown this is a straight line. This is on a Mercator map projection. The hint is that it's a Mercator is Greenland is about the size of South America. And this line is, in fact, the loxodrome between those two points, which means if you were to sail or fly, 
at that particular angle and look at yourself crossing the meridians. As you're crossing the meridians, you're flying northeast, northeast, northeast. You're crossing at that exact same angle the whole way and you'll get to your destination. Very nice, especially in uh, <coughs> The red line, on the other hand, is the geodesic. And that's the shortest line. If you're trying to maximize or minimize your total distance, your total fuel, if you're flying, etc., you want to follow the geodesics. Notice how the angle varies. So we start off in this case and pretty much north, a little bit east. Now we're pretty much northeast. We're going east at this point, and then we start changing and coming down southeast. So our angle is changing constantly as we travel along that great circle, the geodesic. And until the 1990s, airplanes could not do that. They had to follow straight lines, straight rum lines, between certain air traffic, air traffic control towers. In the 90s, with GPS systems, they were allowed to, the major commercial airlines that flew above 38,000 feet were allowed to then fly great circles. And they save, I mean, it's only two or 3% on the distance, but when you look at the amount of fuel an airline uses, significant savings. This is looking at two different points. Um, this is similar to what we were just looking at, showing the rum line between San Francisco and London. It's crossing all the meridians at the same line, the great circle, and if you fly, make that sort of flight, you'll know that you often fly over Greenland and usually close to Iceland. This projection, the rum line is curved, and the great circle is a straight line. So this is a, that one special projection I mentioned called a mnemonic. Um, and you can see how shapes begin to get severely distorted, shapes and areas, as we get very far away from the center at all. So mnemonic is not practical for a very large area at all. Why don't we use great circles all the time? Why don't we do everything in, in geodesics? Well, the math is really, really ugly. To determine the distance between two points on the globe, if you give the, given the latitude and longitude of the two points, this is the formula. Three cosines, two sines, and an arc cosine. Computers are fast, but that's much, much more complicated than two squares and a square root. And imagine doing thousands or tens of thousands of these calculations every second. It becomes much, much faster to just use the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, which is a measurement of distance of a line in two dimensions. All right, so that was, let's talk about the distortions in area. Um, so we know at every parallel of latitude, the all quadrangles have the same area. So as we move our way around the globe, all of those quadrangles, those, those uh, kind of like rectangles, um, are the exact same shape and the exact same area. And then as we move toward the poles, they become smaller and smaller in area. So if you look at a map projection and you see that that's not true, then you can say it's clearly not equilibrium. Before I go much further, let me open this up. I need two people to hold this up for me. Two volunteers. So, this is a graphic that shows all of the map projections available in this one piece of software called Geocart. It has more options than the Esri software, so some of us prefer to use this. Most of these are in, in the Android software. But all the maps, you, all the different maps you see on here are some combination of reds or that bluish green. All those that are purely red are preserving area. So all of these, the shape, everything down here, those are preserving area. The others, the ones that are green, are preserving angles. So this one, this is the, uh, sorry, this is the Mercator right here. It's going into the very deep greens and blues, the further you get from the, <coughs> the equator. So many of them that have both some green and red in them are considered compromised projections. 
some distortion in area, some distortion in angle, um, but not severe in either case. And set it in there. We can all take a look at it later. So angles. Well, think back to what it looks like on the globe. All the parallels and meridians cross each other at 90 degrees. Perpendicular to each other. The quadrangles. And these are the, the individual rectangles or quadrangles. As you move toward the pole, they get skinnier or narrower. This is actually a, a way that it can be conformal and, and for them not to get narrower, but to get taller instead. So that one's a little trickier to um, identify. The ones, again, if it fails either of those tests, you can say it's definitely not conformal. So you see a map projection. So you see this one right here. You see the quadrangle lines crossing. You see all the parallels are nice horizontal lines. All of the meridians are curved lines. So you know it's definitely not a conformal map projection. This, by the way, was uh, done in old school cartography. This is black ink on the plastic paper called Mylar, frosted surface. And uh, the lines were drawn very carefully with uh, um, specific pens and still water soluble, so don't, uh, don't smear it. <laughs> that's one particular projection, that's a sinusoidal. <coughs> Yeah, I did these in, in college when they used to reproduce. This is a different one, a cylindrical projection. Um, the, notice the quadrangles are getting smaller in area as we move toward the pole. As it turns out, this is an equal area projection. So the, um, the reason these only have a single shape on them, a, a continent or a, a space state, is they were done by hand. Yeah, using that, that way you transfer things from one unit to another one very, very carefully. So looking at some specific projections. On the left we have Mercator, on the right we have a Robinson. Again, we can look at this. We see the, air, the angles are current right angles, definitely not conformal. This one, the areas should be getting smaller as we move north and south of the equator. They're not, so it's definitely not equal area. This is looking at Greenland in four different map projections. So this is what familiar with it. This is roughly what this is what it looks like on a Mercator. This is what it looks like on something called Quack Paré. This is what it looks like on a cylindrical. Sorry, sorry, conical some sort of conical. And up in the right, we have an azimuthal, up in the left. So which of those shapes is correct? Sorry? A. A. Anybody want to say anything else? Which of those shapes is correct? I'm going to say about shapes and what properties can preserve. Right. None of them? None of them. None of these are correct. The true shape is this curved shape on the surface. It has a variation in the third dimension. It cannot preserve that. This one is set up so that the, it's an azimuth projection with the plane tangent near the center of the green line. So it looks closest to what it would look like if we were looking at a globe. We center ourselves above that. That's the shape we would see if we put our eyes directly above green. So this is the closest to the, the shape that we would see. But the actual shape is has variation of third dimension. All right, let's look at some other samples. This is a Goods Interrupted Kamala Sun. Fairly popular, especially in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, textbooks. A guy named Good discovered that he could interrupt and that multiple times. So you see these, and this is what I think Professor Kranz illustrated, I think in the orange peel and tearing it. So the more tears you put in, the better you can do the shapes. This actually is an equal area projection. 
areas are preserved. Shapes don't look too bad, angles don't look too bad. So it's pretty good that the sacrifice, in this case, are the oceans. The oceans have been interrupted pretty dramatically. So we get a bad impression, a poor impression of the ocean shapes are. Stereographic. Stereographic is um, here's an anazimuthal projection where we center it at the, at the um, in this case, the North Pole. The way it would be projected, the way it would be constructed, could be done with a, a point of light. But in that case, you would have to move the point of light to the exact opposite point on the surface, on the globe. So if this is what, where we want to center our stereographic, we'd have to bring the light source down to the very bottom point and then project up onto this plane. <coughs> that gives us a stereographic. Here's a Behrman cylindrical equal area. You can see, you can tell that it's, let's see, anything that's rectangular is probably a cylinder in that whole family of cylinders. Um, if the, and then you can look at the shapes and areas of the quadrangles as they're getting smaller toward the poles, it could well be equal area. Um, all the angles appear to be right angles, so maybe it passes that test. It turns out it's equal area but not conformal. Here's the famous Mercator I've been talking about. It's conformal tangent at equator, which is thus a standard line. Distortion increases dramatically because distance from north, north or south. Um, it's suitable for navigation and small equatorial regions. Equatorial regions where it's where the, the cylinder is tangent. And this is actually uh, essentially what is used in Google Maps. And there's a lot of online mapping systems that are will match up. Um, because Google Maps decided 12 years ago to use the Mercator. In fact, they used, um, they used the wrong formulas for the Mercator. They used the spherical formulas for the ellipsoidal latitudes and longitudes. So you get something that's not a true Mercator. But everybody else in the, in the mapping and GIS world had to follow them. And so it became known as the web Mercator. Also, or the Google projection. And that you'll hear this described as web Mercator. A guy named Arnold Peters. Did other parents mention, mention this one? So, Arnold Peters uh, introduced this one. It's fairly controversial. The next slide. Um, he claimed to have discovered it. And it was the way he constructed it. It was an equal area projection. He was not a cartographer. And academic cartographers around the country, indeed around the world, were, were annoyed, were <laughs> irritated that they had not been consulted, uh, and that they were that Peters was claiming credit for this map projection, which in fact had been around for over 100 years, known by a guy named Gall. And there are many, many, many different cylindrical projections that have that rectangular shape and are equal area. If you look on this one, it's all of the all of the ones that are purely red in this top row. Those are all equal area projections. Peter's projection is listed under here as ball. It doesn't even give Peter's any credit for that. One of the the reason he was successful at convincing many people was by comparing it to uh, the Mercator projection. There was a great episode, episode of West Wing from several years ago. Several people shaking their head. And it was like a five minute clip of uh, trying to convince the, I don't know, the characters, but convince them to use the, the Peter's projection. This is another projection you'll often see. Um, and here it's called the unprojected latitude and longitude. And I think about that for a second. It's showing up here on a flat screen. So it's been projected. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to, to show it in two dimensions with that, without doing a projection. The line. Sorry? The line. It's, it's line? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You can say it's line. It's, to call it unprojected is a lot. Now, Earlier versions of Esri software, ArcView 3, um, called this unprojected. 
And that's because the way you construct this is you take the latitude and the longitude and you treat it as an x and a y. So you take the longitude, positive, from 0, you put it on that axis, negative numbers off to the left, positive in the y axis, you just take the latitudes and treat them as if they were planar coordinates, north and south. So there's very, very little math that has to go on to convert it from latitude longitudes into planar coordinates. It's very, very, very fast. That's why one of the reasons it was so popular for a while. It does have another name. It's not just unproject. Uh, it's also known, it's more properly known as the cylindrical equidistant. It's a cylinder that wraps around the equator. Distances are preserved as we move from the equator to the pole. Okay. Nice neat squares, so 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. Okay. So it's equidistant. It's actually equidistant in any, any measurement that runs along the north-south line. But it does have a, a proper name, um, cylindrical equidistant. The mnemonic projection, do you remember what's special about the mnemonic? Is it up there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the one that preserves great circles. Sorry, has great circles are straight lines. And this is exactly what you get when you have this point source of light in the center of the globe, and you project it out onto a plane. Okay. This, you've done a mnemonic, mnemonic projection. So once you've got it in there, any straight line you draw will be following the great circle route. So you can be property. Have you seen this? XKCD comic? Uh, <laughs> this artist is uh, just brilliant. Anytime he'll go in and do a, uh, any one of his subjects, <coughs> extremely well researched. Um, I'll put these out there. I'll put the slides I've shown you out on the server somewhere or something like this. It'll be, you know, you'll enjoy, maybe you'll enjoy, if you're into projections, I find it. I'll really enjoy looking at this. Um, but once the traditional Mercator, you're not really into maps. <laughs> Dynaxion, you like Isaac Asimov, XML, and shoes with toes. You think the Segway got a bad rap. You own 3D goggles, which you use to do rotating models or better 3D goggles, and you type into four app. <laughs> Good to model sign. Uh, a globe. Yes, you're very clever. <laughs> that is obviously a projection. Um, and then, you know, the Waterman butterfly, sort of shaped like a butterfly. That's the plat carré, which is the one where you also know it's unprojected or cylindrically equidistant. You think this one is fine, you like how X and Y map to latitude and longitude. The other projections overcomplicate things. You want me to stop poking, asking, you want me to stop asking about maps so you can enjoy dinner. <laughs> Waterman butterfly looks like a butterfly. And Gal Peters down here at the very end. <laughs> Gal Peters is not very popular. All right. Uh, <laughs> Let me try and pull this up. <coughs> so this is one particular projection. Changing on you. So it's not centered on the equator right now. If it were, you'd see a straight horizontal line. Nice thing about this. The projection is, it looks like it's a Malvida projection. You can tell that by all of the meridians being ellipses. But I can just go on here, and I can change that. I can make that great spot. So <laughs> I can center it. And if I want to center it on the pole, I can do that. So you can play with it. So you know, if we want to do the uh, LA River, you can simply bring that to the center, and that would have the least possible distortion. Um, the least possible distortion when projected with this particular map projection. So that's one site. 
the PowerPoint I'll leave behind has a list of several others that you can take a look at. This particular site, it's not nearly as colorful as the other one, but it lets you choose from any different projection down here. And you can still rotate things around, um, spin it around, and change the rotation. All right, I'm going to choose one of these map projection videos to show you. That was the last one. The one that we were looking at was this short animation demonstrating Jason Davies. I'd like to look at the Viria Pedro. projecting many, many different possible shapes. So in, you're seeing just many, many different gores. So that was some sort of conical. We can split the earth up. This is centered on the pole. These are all fairly symmetric so far. This one's opened up at the equator. But we can go very irregular. Now, this is the waterman butterfly. And you see, many of these where the shapes look pretty good, they're achieved by, by putting many, many, many cuts or interruptions into the outline at the sacrifice of, so at the, sacrifice of the continuity. We're seeing many interruptions. Thank you. 
It's been adopted by all the NATO countries and many others. So when you're sharing data with, con with other countries, it's um, quite convenient. And it's always metric. The way it works is by splitting the Earth up into 60 zones. Each zone is six degrees wide, 360 divided by 60, six degrees wide. Starting at 180 degrees west, and they're numbered one, two, three, four, etc. Every six degrees is another. And so zones one through 30 appear in the western hemisphere, and then 31 through 60 are in the eastern hemisphere. Those are the names of the numbers of the zones, not individual lines. Those are the numbers of the zones. In the United States, these are the zones you're likely to encounter. Everything, these are the zones you'll encounter in the R48. And all, all of Southern California will be in zone 11. Okay, so I said it's called the UTM, the Universal Transverse Mercator. Well, it's a mercator, so the math doesn't, the math is different because it's transverse, transverse <coughs> but the properties are similar so that it's still conformal. That's, that's a nice property. Suitable for zones with predominant north-south extent, such as one of those six degree wide swaths. Um, and distortion increases with distance east and west of the central meridian. Within each zone, distortion is limited to one part in 2,500. Is that good or bad? It means if you make a measurement of 2,500 feet, you might be off by as much as one foot. It's not great. Remember, we projected this onto a flat surface, and so we have to sacrifice something. All right, so what's that look like on here? So, you notice, of course, that there's a little pedestal down here that I can't do much about, unless you make one of these. So this is another cylinder. So you can imagine projecting it under that cylinder. That's it would be an ordinary mercator. But it's transverse. So we do that by taking that cylinder and rotating it. transverse, mercator, and as we work through the different zones, it's going to be centered on different meridians of longitude. Can't go all the way over to the United States, but you get the idea. So now we have taken the regular mercator, rotated at 90 degrees, and we have transverse mercator. The other coordinate system you're likely to encounter in working with data in the, in the United States is SPC, or State Plane Coordinate System. It was developed in the, actually before UTM, developed in the 30s by the US Coast and Geodetic Surveyors to provide a common reference system for highway engineering, survey marker location, and other high precision needs. Imagine you're planning, you're laying out a road went from two different directions and you want to make sure they meet. Very important that you have um, high accuracy. The goal was to design a Cartesian system, an ordinary two-dimensional XY system, um, with a maximum scale of distortion of one part in 10,000. Then consider the limit of surveying accuracy. So remember in the 1930s and everything's based on angles, because of the, fine, the finest measurement we could make on the angles, one part in 10,000. To compare that to one part to the UTM, which was one part in 2,500, which one's better? Which one's more accurate? Six. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the SPC. SPC is more accurate, right? If you think, if you have, so this is, if you went 10,000 feet, you'd be off by a foot. Could be off by as much as a foot. Make sense of that? Take the one part in 2,500 to multiply both sides by four. So if you're in the UTM, you can, you'd be off by four parts in 10,000. Make that same 10,000 foot measurement, you'd be off by four feet in the UTM. And that's the worst case scenario. So 
To do that, to achieve that level of accuracy, they had to divide the country up into many, many different zones. They followed state boundary lines. Then depending on the zone, they'd use one of two different projections. Notice that there are a few states in here, Nebraska and Montana, that are different. They're much larger zone. Any idea why? It's not densely populated. They're not <coughs> fighting over land very much. There's a lot of it. They're off by 10, 20 feet. Nobody really cares. Same thing in the rest. <laughs> so the states, not completely facetious, the states decided that it was much easier to switch to a single zone for their entire state and suffer the distortion and accuracy, but for the simplicity in exchange for the simplicity. California is divided into six zones. And some of them are run north south, some of them run east west. What the results and what the determines that is what kind of map projection you use. The ones that run north south will use a transverse mercator, where you have the transverse mercator, the lines run north, the standard meridian, central meridian will run north south, very little distortion as you move away from it. The other direction, if it runs east-west, you'd use a Lambert conformal conic. Thinking, why are we using a conic? Well, we have lots of conformal map projections we could use, but we want one that has standard parallels that run right through the state, the middle of the state we're using. So we use that cone, or this cone, or this cone, depending on where we are. So it was some states it was up to the state to decide. They could have split California up into about the same number of zones running north south. But back then they decided to go that way. Um, right, so the orientation of the zones is a function of the shape of the state. Um, the Lambert conformal for east west, transverse mercator for north south. Those are both conformal projections. And again, conformal was critical for the surveyors because that's how they were measuring distances, angles, and locations. We're all based on that. There's one uh, odd example, and that's for the uh, panhandle of Alaska, which is on an oblique rotator. It runs at a nice aspect at, a, at an angle. So take that cylinder and rotate it until the line lines up with the panhandle. There's the six zones you see for California. I'm going to zoom into the upper ones so we can see them. So for each one of those zones, so let's take one of these, zone three here. For each one of those zones, we'll have two standard parallels. Two standard parallels because we decided to use a cone that intersects the globe here and pops out there. So we have two lines running through this area that are standard with no distortion. And then each one of these zones will have a different pair of standard lines. Um, it gets really messy when you look at the actual x and y coordinate system because it uses what's called a false origin. So instead of uh, just in a nutshell, it's you know, this central meridian, these standard parallels, it might make sense to call that 0, 0. But they don't do that because then it has negative numbers to work with. Surveyors aren't negative. <laughs> So they wanted to shift the origin way to the west and way to the south so that everything was positive. Okay? That's the whole reason for false origins, using false origins. Um, back up if I can. Now it's not working. Okay. Zone 5 and zone 6. We're located actually right about there. We're actually, the map of Redlands, topographic map of Redlands, spans the boundary. Because the boundary line follows the county boundary lines. The topo map includes this little sliver of Riverside County at the bottom in zone six. So it makes it a real challenge if you're looking at state plane coordinates on the on the Redlands topo, or in the Redlands. So we're in six or five. So we're in, look, all of Redlands is in five. All of San Bernardino County is in five. 
Montana and Nebraska. We were wondering about that. I think Shayla, you, someone asked that. I remember last time we did. Now you know? No real reason other than population. Any else? I would think one of you would ask, why, are that, why do we really care about map projections that much in GIS? I mean, you must get that question. What? Sure. Well, I'm saying that map, the map projection you use determines the accuracy. Have uh, maximum accuracy, minimum distortion. So, for example, what projection would you use for the LA River? If you wanted to minimize distortion, if it was, if it was critical to have the maximum possible accuracy down to centimeters, then you would pick a map projection where the standard line followed the axis of the LA River. That would be the best mm -hmm. one. The other, the, the more significant issue is that you'll get data, when you're working with GIS data, it will come in from different sources on different projections. And you have to bring them all together onto, <coughs> so that they register in your database. It used to be really difficult to do that. Today with the software, as long as the metadata is correct, the metadata file that tells you what projection it's in, as long as that's correct, the software can handle everything else. But it's not always correct. In fact, maybe 90%, maybe only about 90% of the time, is the metadata file correct. And so you'll see things like an 80 meter shift in all of your coordinates. What do you think that 80 meter shift would be? Just a using the old data. Using the old data, right. So some was on NAT 27, some was on NAT 83. Maybe. Uh, on one map, one data set, everything looks like three times as large. It's three times as large in the X. So, so the area you're looking at is three times as wide and three times as high. So when, answer? yeah, when you, like how would you know that the datum is wrong? If, like how could you see that you've shifted 80 meters over? But you take the same set of lines from two different sources and see if they register. If they don't register, one of the data sets is, is wrong. If you see things that are factor of three off, you may well have a problem with whether it's feet or meters. Encounter that. That's just you know, one little attribute in the metadata files, whether it's in feet or meters. Easy to get one attribute wrong. That yeah, referencing is was a lot harder <coughs> when you couldn't just add a base map that had all the imagery for the entire world on it to figure out whether your lines were matched up right. You'd have to like bring in some roads, bring in some other stuff to see if it looked right, basically. And uh, it's gotten a lot easier now that we have all these kind of base take, maps. Can you take online sources, like you know, an ArcGIS baseline, a base map, or a Google Maps, and bring it in, and you bring in some other data and put it on top of it, and it doesn't line up? Which one's wrong? Not necessarily Google Maps. Your data might be more correct. Like they take the imagery and they have to geo-reference it. They have to tie it to the ground based on specific points, and they're not perfect. So don't assume your data is wrong. It could be theirs. Any other questions? Yep. Where can we get a clear acrylic globe like that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you one for five hundred dollars. <laughs> well, that took about ten, ten hours of labor labor of love. Easily ten hours of work. What about just the globe itself? Um, that one you can you can purchase that. 
Because I'll image it online, I'll show you the thing. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, it'd be cool if you could put it up. That would be written in the middle of the spend and the algorithm. <laughs> that would, yeah, that'd be fairly nice. The, um, the ones that you'll purchase will be mounted with the axis set to 23 and a half degrees to reflect the uh, tilt of the axis. So that would be very difficult to work with that. So once you break it apart, you can straighten it out. So it's vertical. Mm. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Okay, we're going to put that up on YouTube right now. And yeah. Watch it again. Over and over again.